the most amazing place to find yourself, located in Him. Thank God for GPS, as I remember, was it last year or a year before? I think last year when we had rolled in Aileen's car and we were blessed with three nights in Yosemite. And we took off, never been to Yosemite before. But thank God for Siri and for <laughs> GPS, <laughs> and for technology. And I'm always so amazed to imagine that if we could invent technology that could do that. We still have some rooms, uh, places available in France. So any of you guys, please don't stand because we might stay here until daybreak. So just um, if you could move up and make sure that everybody gets a decent seat. So we live in an amazing day where technology helps us trust what we do not really know ourselves. So we took off to Yosemite and um, we had a wonderful trip there and back. I think we, via, we came by here as well, if I'm right, last year. And I remember at one specific time in San Francisco, we, we were kind of on the right road, but not sure whether we were heading in the right direction. And... Um, you know, you kind of zoom in, you know, zoom in to really get the street names. And then you need to just zoom out again to just make sure you're going in the right direction. And I so appreciate our fellowship, you know, that we are not loners just on some kind of like um, Godfrey Bertel's things about what is this thing about alone in outer space or just floating around. But we've discovered family, we've discovered fellowship, we've discovered a place which is so much more at home than any definition of home could ever compete with, you know. Um, oh, I mean, the people, the disciples of Jesus felt so nervous when he pointed to the, the building, you know, the temple in Jerusalem, and he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And this is in John 2, 19, so we've still got a few chapters to go. So they got all nervous and said, well, you know, you could get killed for public statements and status updates like that. You know, we, we, we cannot say anything against the address of God's house on this planet in Jerusalem. And then Jesus just comes to redefine the temple of God. He says, in three days, I will raise it up. There is a resurrection that we participate in. You know, while we were dead in our trespasses without our permission. God made us alive together with Christ. This is the mystery of the ages. We did not begin in our mother's womb, but in the most intimate thought of deity. There is a union where we were born from. And this is why we are so attracted to one another. We are so drawn because we recognize the brotherhood. The Greek word... Um, for, bre for brethren, sharing the same womb is exactly what it says. It's sharing the same womb, the same origin, the same beginning. There is nothing that is not authentic about you. Our minds have, have accommodated so many lies for so long that the lie became our identity. But he says you will know the truth. You continue in my word. You discover what the word reveals that John helps us to see. You know, the gospel did not begin with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm so glad that John gives us a reference beyond time. It takes us into eternity. He says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was face to face with God. And nothing in this reflection distracted from who God is. And the destiny of this word has always been to become flesh. To become flesh. Thank God for what we have recorded on the page. But the page could never unveil what is unveiled in you. Living epistles known and read by all. You speak mother tongue language wherever you travel. We've just had the privilege to um, interrupt our American tour. We've been in America now since just about 28th of April we arrived. And then um, the 22nd of May we took off to Colombia. We spent three weeks in Colombia, Mexico. We've never been there before. But what a joy to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, the most remote places in Colombia, in wherever on this planet. 
and discover that mother tongue language carries the same global appeal because it's so authentic it's so God and he has no hidden agenda but to love you to overwhelm you with himself when Jesus' brother James writes about him. Remember, none of Jesus' brothers believed in him during the time of his ministry. I think he was kicked out of his home as well um, because he speaks about foxes having holes and birds having nests, but the Son of Man having nowhere to go at night. And uh, so there was a time where he's near king, Kin stood outside. I don't know what they did there when they were meant and always embraced to be inside. And you got the little note, remember? Your mother and brothers are waiting outside. And he didn't interrupt his um, conversation saying, well, I'm so sorry, I've gone over my time again and neglecting my family. He says, look around you, my mother and my brothers. You see, he came to introduce us to the greater family. When Paul prays in Ephesians 3, 7, 3, 15, he says, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named Simon, son of Jonah. Allow me to introduce you to you, Mr. Rock. <laughs> Look to the rock from which you were hewn, the quarry from which you were dug. You see, God is a reference to you that outdates your natural birth. As a human race, we share three births in common. We began in God. <laughs> Lydia and I have iPhones. She finally went from the cheapest little model of uh, mobile phone that you can imagine. Nobody in, in South Africa, they steal stuff. But nobody would bother to steal Lydia's <laughs> mobile phone. <laughs> She recently inherited one of the children's, you know, we get a two-year program on us. So she also has an iPhone now. And, and um, I always tell people, especially now when we're in Mexico, you know, the fact that we have iPhones bought in South Africa, but we didn't have to go and congratulate the shopkeeper for a wonderful design. Because we know it didn't begin in that shop in Cape Town. And on the back it says, made in China. <laughs> So it doesn't matter where you were born on this planet. Do not be distracted from where you began. You are his authentic idea. We began in God. There is no other reference that can define you more. Thank God for a mother's womb. Thank God for celebrating Mother's Day. We did that in Houston, Don Keatley's church, just recently with our Mother's Day celebrations. If you can get a hold of that, um, they recorded that teaching. It was an amazing teaching. If you go to Don Keatley's ministry in Houston, Texas. But we were just so overwhelmed again by the thought that he knew us before he formed us in our mother's school. You are not a surprise to him, to them. Father, Son, and Spirit always knew you. You've always been their idea. And so we have that birth globally in common. And then we celebrate the fact that not one of us arrived on this planet, but through our mother's womb. And we honor our mothers and our dads. <laughs> People congratulated us on our four children. I remember when the first one was born, I said to them, it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> So here we are sharing another birth, our mother's womb. And then Peter gives us insight when he eventually gets the message. In 1 Peter 1 verse 3, he says, We were born anew when Jesus was raised from the dead. So there's not one human being on planet earth that is not equally included in those three births. Born from above, born in the flesh, and in the theology of God, in the economy of God's belief. When Jesus died, we died together with Him. And this all happened, by the way, without our permission, remember? 
I mean, we, Adam didn't have our permission to include us. And we didn't know what sin was, says Paul in Romans 7, until the law introduced us to it. And so multitudes of nations on this planet have no clue about their new birth in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead until we tell them, until the gospel reveals what happened. You see, the gospel is not a conglomeration of our theological thought and doctrine that we've gathered over years, but it has always been what it was in the beginning. The gospel did not evolve in time. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus, the same yesterday. And it doesn't matter how far we go back with any definition of yesterday into any direction of history. Without discovering his sameness there. Into eternity. The sameness. He never had any other agenda but to embrace his image and his likeness in human form. There is such a rich revelation. Thank you, Lani. Thank you so much. Oh, I've got one here. No, I've got two. We leave that one for a while, see if it doesn't turn into wine. Uh, no, oh, Jesus. We don't need to turn water into wine in Napa Valley area. So, um, <laughs> I'm so absolutely amazed every time we share these truths with the gospel, you know, where it began and how we are totally, totally embraced there from the beginning. Lani, could I borrow a mirror Bible from you? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Here's one. Let me see. I'll get one too. This is the second edition. I need another blue one. The third edition, please. Have you got it, Lani? Uh, no, don't worry. I had one English one. We, we've got we've launched the Spanish mirror now in in uh, Mexico and in Colombia. No, Lani, Lon, Lon, don't go down. Is that the third edition? I'm so sorry to borrow it from you, but I'll give. <laughs> I had one that 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 lasted for the three weeks, and then I, yesterday on the airport in Mexico, I gave it away. But I just wanted to draw your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. Um, you might not recognize it um, in your um, other translations, but it carries the same thought. But what I want to highlight is the fact that he rescued the integrity of our original design and revealed that we have always been his own from the beginning. I just so love the way the gospel communicates ownership. I mean, the lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, immediately points to ownership. You cannot be lost unless you belong. And so it's in that place of belonging that this gospel finds its absolute integrity. We are not called to join some kind of club to become members of yet another organization. But our spirit echoes Abba Father because he says, my sheep know my voice. And uh, before we get a bit exclusive in the idea of my sheep, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. The shepherd never forsook the sheep. We've always only been His. There is only one authentic father of the human race. How could a father of lies compete with God's authentic ownership? We've been His own from the beginning. Even before time was, 
This has nothing to do with anything we did to qualify or disqualify ourselves. We are not talking religious good works or karma here. Jesus unveils grace to be the eternal intent of God. Grace celebrates our pre-creation innocence and now declares our redeemed union with God in Christ Jesus. The happy announcement. <laughs> Good news, it always was, even when God spoke prophetically through the pages of the Old Testament. It always was good news. Everything, verse 10, 2 Timothy 1, verse 10, everything that grace pointed to is now realized in Jesus Christ and brought into clear view through the gospel. Jesus is what grace reveals. He took death out of the equation and redefines life. This is good news indeed. Grace is my commission, says Paul in verse 11. It is my job and joy to proclaim this message and guide the nations into a full understanding of the love initiative of God. Now, in our commentary note here, I've just quoted Titus as well, so I might as well read it while we've got that page. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. This is the life of the ages that was anticipated for generations. So when Paul speaks about this in Colossians 1.27, he speaks about the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. The fact that it was hidden did not distract from the authentic value of this mystery. And this mystery is now revealed in the gospel. Man's, uh, the life of our original design announced by the infallible resolve of God before time or space existed. Man's union with God is the original thought that inspired creation. The Bible in basic English says this life was made certain before eternal time. So I'm reading these thoughts just to give context to what we celebrate in the gospel. The gospel is not some modern uh, philosophical idea that we begin to proclaim on Facebook to make people feel better about themselves. The gospel is the authentic idea of God. And in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are rebooted to our original design. You see, Jesus did not arrive on planet Earth 2014 years ago to politely apologize for a faulty design. He came to declare the righteousness of God. The Hebrew word for righteousness is the word tzedek. Tzedek is a very interesting word. It speaks of the beam in a scale of balances. We've just had dinner at the restaurant. I don't know whether you noticed we had this invisible butler who just like the doors swung open as we got there. But that's not the point. Then there was this old-fashioned scale. I took a picture with it on my iPhone. I've got that picture there. But we are all familiar with scales and um, in our justice system, I think in most countries, the scale of balances represents the whole idea of justice. So it's no surprise that the word righteousness carries that idea of a scale of balances. Now to give context to the righteousness of God, we need to appreciate Genesis 1 verse 26. That God said, let us, Elohim said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. So if we had a board where we could write this down, I would show you various pictures of scales. But just use your imagination and see a scale of balances. And here is God in my right hand. And God's idea is to express himself for the first time in the history of the universe. 
in human form. And nothing in human form will distract from who God is, because God is speaking image and likeness language. So if we want to discover the sameness of Jesus, we need to find reference in the fact that God's righteousness is God's expression in physical form of His image and His likeness. Now in our idea of the old-fashioned scales, if you have to buy something, let's say you have to go to the market and buy some rice, and you want one pound of rice, or how many ounces you want of rice, then you have a standard weight. And the standard weight determines the transaction. You know, the idea is not to just, you know, dump in some rice in the basket and then just walk off and, you know, pay for whatever you imagine. No, no, the idea is to actually get the scale to move. Ever so slightly, but it has to move. And no shopkeeper would go and count the individual grains of rice to make sure that you did not perhaps take five too many. Because it's just a, a rice transaction. But the equation becomes a complete different reality when you weigh gold. The more precious the substance, the more accurate a reading is required. The scale needs to be absolutely precisely correct to the decimal point, to the ounce of gold. So if we are that fanatical about making sure that we have an accurate weight when it comes to weighing gold. We still have some open seats here in front, guys. How much more the creator of the universe, the one who hangs every planet and star and galaxy in precision, how much more accurate would God be in expressing His righteousness, His image, His likeness, and in redeeming that? I remember in 1978 I joined Youth of the Mission um, in South Africa because I had nothing else to do at that time. I mean, I was just kicked out of... Um, I, we, I was part of the Dutch Reformed Church and they had a seven-year program to train their reverence, you know. So you do the first three years, we get a bit of Greek and Hebrew, and, and then you qualify to go to theology. I got kicked out of the theology school before I got there, thank God. But um, <laughs> So here I land up in, in Youth of the Mission and my dad bought me a brand new Bible. And I, I, I loved reading and studying scripture and it was a wide margin. And he bought me a very expensive rot ring pen that we in South Africa imported from America, uh, from Germany. And so I would love to, my dad was, you know, he would make little notes and reference. And so I'm so excited about this new Bible, the 1st of January. I'm like introduced to my new Bible, new page. You know, you're going to do two chapters, Old Testament every day. Then you go through the Old Testament once a year, three, two chapters new, three times a year through the new. And I'm getting into Genesis. And you know what it's like with a new page? You kind of just draw on that page. Man, it's just new revelation. It's just such a moment. And then um, when I got to verse 26, I was just overwhelmed. For the first time in my life, I began to see context to the cross. I mean, why would God go to the extent of suffering a criminal death by the hands of His creation? if it wasn't to redeem what he always had in mind, his image and his likeness. We've attached so much sentimental value to the blood and to the cross without understanding the equation of God's faith. That what he knew of himself to be unveiled in you would be accurately redeemed. So if we Go back to our first equation, the standard measure, the image, and the likeness of God. The Hebrew word for weight is the word kabot, which we translate glory. Thank God for the weight of glory. So the standard weight in this equation is the glory 
of God to begin with. And if we would want to study the ingredient of the glory of God, we have to discover that it's all about a fellowship. You see, the Greek word for righteousness is the word dikaiosune. And if you break it up into its root word, dike, D-I-K-E, it's the word for two parties finding likeness in one another. You see, it so takes righteousness out of the idea of something that I've got to get right and try and, you know, gain some kind of approval and qualify myself to, to just be embraced. But here he comes and he declares his righteousness. So the ingredient of this weight of glory is this place of fellowship, of oneness. And it's a place of absolute belonging, absolute value, absolute identity. My I amness is found there. Absolute innocence. Absolute authority. And what was it that Adam and Eve traded this for? When they partook of the tree, the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. There is such a lovely parable that you could go and Google. It's an old legend from Morocco. Hello. <laughs> this Moroccan legend says that... Um, in the original sin, they pictured the story for centuries. They've told the story. Um, Eve was approached by the serpent and he introduced it to the fruit of this tree and said to her, if you eat of this fruit, you will become a lot more beautiful than what you are. And she immediately said, well, I would not need that um, to happen because I am Adam's girl. You know, I don't have any competition. <laughs> and he persuaded her otherwise. He said, no, but Adam has the secret lover and he's hiding her in this cave in the mountain. So she was very inquisitive and thought, well, let's go and see for ourselves then. And so he led her on this very windy road and got her to the opening of this cave and prompted her to look into the cave. And what she saw there was the reflection of her own face in a pool of water. But she did not realize this. She immediately took the fruit and ate it. She thought this was the other woman. And then the legend says that all who are not deceived by the reflection in the water returns to paradise. So what happened to Adam and Eve when they partook of this, I call it the I am not tree system? They lost their consciousness of glory. So you take the kabot out of the scale, what happens? The whole thing just collapses. Did God's mind change about Adam and Eve? Did God's heart change towards them? Did the prodigal father's mind become influenced by the other brother's record keeping of his imagination of what his brother is doing with the money? God did not change. God spoke by his faith the same language he did all along. Because in the beginning was the word. And so in order to accommodate mankind as his audience, God now introduces a new language. A language that includes the good and the evil. A language that announces the promise. And in order to speak the language of man's shame, because now what does lost glory leave Adam and Eve with? Immediately, a lost sense of belonging, a lost sense of value, a lost sense of identity. Suddenly it's a I am not identity that is embraced. A lost sense, obviously, of innocence. Shame now replaces innocence. Guilt, condemnation replaces my innocence. And lust is my authentic authority. Now it's all about competing with the next 
object in the next situation. So competition is born, religion is born there, where glory was lost in the garden. And so here God comes and he begins to speak the language of our judgment by introducing the language of the law. And it's so interesting if you read Exodus chapter 20 to see how the very first thing the law addresses is our lost sense of likeness and image. Thou shalt worship no other God besides me. Any graven image, whether it's out of wood or stone, decorated in gold or silver, decorated in years of theological study, carving out doctrines after doctrines with my words, becomes the same deception of the same tree that engages people under a control system where we've got to try and shape up and measure up and do things in order to become. So here mankind sits with a sense of lost kabut, lost glory, and the law would encourage him to do everything in his might to try and add weight to what was lost in the original image. You see, this image cannot be replaced by any other idea of any other image. I would want to read you from Isaiah 40, but it's a dangerous chapter because there's so much here. But let me just touch on Isaiah 40 and verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Remember what we are talking about is the image and the likeness of God, the invisible God, the creator of the universe, expressed in time in human form. And now Adam, on humanity's behalf, lost that reference, that likeness. So imagination now takes over. And imagination births philosophy and religion carving out images after images to somehow try and measure up again to this drive in my being. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with Him? Can you see that the theme of this book is all about likeness and image? Two parties finding likeness in each other. Dikaiosune. Tzedek. This beam in the scale of balances. Or what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman casts it. A goldsmith plates it with gold. And a silversmith fashions chains of silver and decorates the thing. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. At least get some mileage out of your idol. You know what I mean? Um, and then there's another requirement. He seeks, him out, he seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman. I mean, Paul speaks to those Greek philosophers, remember in Acts 17, and um, uh, acknowledging the fact that they've been very artistic in their expressions, in their guesses about God, building all kinds of shrines and altars. There has to be an altar. I mean, you, can't, you cannot even begin to think to approach God outside of an altar context. Because what does the altar represent? My best effort to try and reconcile this monster, angry God, to my effort. Somehow balance the scale again. You know, if I can just, I mean, that's karma all over. You know, if, I, if I've done something bad, let's just get something good in, and to somehow outweigh the bad. You remember when Jesus first encountered Simon? I mean, Simon and his um, fellow fishermen had a very, very bad night. They took nothing and they toiled all night. So if you have nothing to show for your labor, you don't feel very exuberant. You know, you feel lousy. You feel absolutely miserable. You have nothing to show, especially if you're a Jew and you have a crowd of customers and there's nothing to sell. And so Jesus encourages Simon to, um, he saw, I mean, Jesus is a good fisher of men, you know. He saw that Simon was really in a spot. And um, 
You know how it happened, he got himself a captive audience in Simon, he used his boat, rowed out deep enough so that Simon couldn't just jump out and swim back, or walk back, couldn't swim that man. But here he was, and Simon heard enough in Jesus' teaching to ignite faith, as we know it. He didn't know what was happening to him, but when Jesus suggested after his talk, let's go out and fish, there was no argument. It wasn't like, well, you know, Jesus, is, you know, I've been toiling all night, there's no fish in this dam. I can promise you that I've got proof. There's no fish here. I've done everything that we learned to do for many generations, and it didn't show any. Anyway, um, Simon immediately said, let's go. And, and you know what happened? The nets were tearing. They had to call in the other boats. But what startles me is the way Simon responds to Jesus when he tries to make this equation, because he knows that his own efforts had nothing to bring to the table. He was still in karma mode, law mode. I took nothing last night, but I'm paying for last week's sins. <laughs> so at least tomorrow night, you know, I can balance out the scale again. He says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Can you see how sin consciousness immediately replaces everything that glory represents? Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 1, where, Paul, where Peter speaks with such eloquence about the fact that we have received everything that pertains to life and godliness. Granted, not rewarded, granted. Everything that it takes to live life to the full, gifted. And now in this context of faith, he explains the dynamic of discovering in faith every virtue, every place of elevation that we occupy in the mind of God. And then he explore, explores that. And then he comes with a thought that, um, I think it's verse 9, Second Peter 1 verse 9. He says, whoever lacks these things, which things? These things that were granted to us. Everything that it takes to live life to the full. Whoever lacks these things have become blind and short-sighted. So do they lack anything? Nope. But if you're blind to it, you do. Why did they become blind? Because they have forgotten that they were cleansed from their previous sins. Do you see the moment our innocence is compromised? The very quality of the glory seems to vanish, dissolve. And so our best efforts to try and add weight fails us. Until Paul cries out, he says, with my best intentions, I will to do good, but I fail. Oh, wretched man that I am. Now let's just read on here about this skillful craftsman. And he prepares an idol that will not totter. Isn't this interesting? That this idol needs two qualities. At least a very hard wood. So I can get mileage out of my idol. And that the thing can stand up. You know, I don't want to pray and the thing falls over. It's got to have good feet. It reminds me of the little rock cut out by no human hand that struck that man-made image on its feet of clay. No wonder that he speaks about the lowest part of your body as the very place of dominion. Where you touch the earth, you crush the serpent's head. So even in the imaginary idol, we wanted something that will stand the test of time. And the pressure I'm going to exert on my idol. Because we're trying to get so much mileage out of our ideas of what we need to do. What we need to earn. What we need to drive. How we need to dress. How we need to behave in order to somehow redeem a bit of dignity and identity. Again, what a clumsy system we invented. Yeah. In our societies. And here is God's response. Verse 21 of Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you. From the beginning. You see grace is not a modern invention. Because we've run out of charismatic ideas. To draw crowds. <laughs> Has it not been told to you from the beginning? 
Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? Oh, now I've got tears in my eyes and I can't read that little Bible. Thank you, Jesus. See, your beginning is authentic. The same Father who knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb declared in Scripture a prophetic word that carried the weight of his intent. And earlier on in that same chapter of Isaiah 40, he says, Every high place shall be brought low. Every valley shall be filled up. Every crooked place shall be made straight. Even the rough places shall be made smooth. The engineer of the universe is the engineer of your salvation. It's not a Mickey Mouse gospel that just somehow compromise positive vibes that you can feel better about yourself. You shall call his name Jesus because his name is God's idea of rescuing his image and his likeness in human form. In the only tabernacle, in the only tabernacle that is worthy to be his address on this planet. In three days I will raise it up. While we were still dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ and raised us together with Christ and seated us together with Christ. If then we are raised together with him, engage your thoughts, set your minds upon the things that are above and not upon the things that are below. So in God's tzedek judgment, he declares, it is finished. His Sabbath rest celebrates perfection. And behold, everything that he had made was very good. God did not go into this place of um, scrutinizing his own creation by wearing dark red glasses, you know, just to see everything through the blood. Adam was not clothed in animal skin so that God could look differently at him. But so that God could make them feel better about themselves and give them a prophetic picture of the ultimate redemption where the Lion of Judah would become Lamb of God, clothed in human skin, and give himself to be the ultimate scapegoat of our religious uh, distortioned minds that we've inherited from the wrong tree. If you read the Septuagint translation, which is the Greek of the original language, you will see the Greek <coughs> word there for good and evil, the tree of the knowledge. You see, it's a tree of knowledge. It's all about knowledge. It's a mind thing. The knowledge of good and evil. The word evil is the word poneros, which means full of labors, hardships, and annoyances. Does that sound familiar? Not that one, the labors, annoyances, and hardships. <laughs> the one that engages all your time, all your energy, all your effort, all your willpower to somehow just balance the scales again. I thank God for scripture. I thank God for what the Bible carries. Because the promise is destined to become person. The word is destined to become flesh. Thank God for the incarnation. So if you in your imagination just see the scale, the tzedek of God, and then draw a line of, you know, the mental um, picture of man's veiled understanding. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 says, The God of this world, meaning the God system of this world, the religious system of this world, blindfolds the minds of the unbeliever to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. And what does the light of the gospel reveal? The glory of God in the face of a man. Remember Isaiah 40? Every high place, every valley, every crooked place, even the rough places. Why? For the revealing of the glory of God. And all flesh shall see it together. You see, God wants to give context to His glory. 
not in our imagination, but in the original thought, the word that became flesh, face to face. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen the Father. Any idea we have of God that is unlike Jesus can never again qualify to be God. Doesn't matter how many references we try and gather, references to support our ideas. When Paul introduces the Greek philosophers to the true God, the one they comment on when they say the unknown, he says, he's the creator of the universe. He gives you your next breath. And here's the good news. He is not far from each one of us. How, how would Paul dare speak such language? Has he forgotten that he's not addressing a group of converted Christians? He's addressing a group of pagan worshippers. For centuries, for generations, they've followed their ideas. They've carved out their imaginative gods. And yet Paul addresses them. And he quotes their own philosophy when he says, In him we live and move and have our being. And then he reminds them of what Arata said 300 years back. We are indeed his offspring. And then he reasons with them, if we are his offspring, how can we try and compete with God by carving some image out of stone. How can that image match the original if we are his offspring? You see, Jesus didn't say, guys, sorry man, the first creation was a bit of a flop. You know, we didn't want it to turn out like this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to kill it on, a, on the cross and we'll resurrect the brand new one. And all the ladies will at least have two sets of arms. And so that they can really multitask. And we could... And, no, no, no. Jesus came to rescue your original design. If we are a brand new creation that never existed before, then God should never have gone into his rest when he created Adam. Then we're talking about an illegitimate Sabbath. Jesus came to redeem the original image and likeness bearing human body. In him the fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily form. And you are complete in Him, he declares, Paul does in Colossians 2, 9 and 10. So we discover our completeness in Him. You see, if the, if the Christian species is so-called a brand new creation that never existed before, then why do Christians sin? Not just ordinary sins. The most horrid you can imagine. Your thoughts, says Isaiah 50, 55, are not my thoughts. Therefore your ways are not my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways than your ways. And please don't close the book there. Because the next verse is then good news. He says, but as the rain and the snow comes down from heaven. To do what? To cancel the distance. To saturate the soil. So shall my word be. My word's destiny is incarnate flesh. Making the earth bring forth and sprout. Instead of the briar, the fir tree. Instead of the thorn, the fir. Instead of the briar, the myrtle. And here God comes and communicates what his gospel ignites in our understanding when we realize who we are. And when our authentic design is redeemed. If you just see these pictures now, you've got the original image and likeness. And then below that, you've got the fall, which is this distorted scale of balances. The glory is lost. We all have sinned, says Paul Colossians, Romans 3 to 20, and fallen short of the glory of God. And so this is where our sin keeps us. Our sin keeps us engaged with the I am not language system. And so here we are, trapped in this situation. And so God begins to speak to the human race prophetically and profoundly in law language. But all along, above the line, you've got the same reference, the same faith. God calling things which were not that visible anymore. 
as though they are. So God's faith was never compromised through Adam's fall. God's Sabbath was never sacrificed. God's rest was, was never at risk. He continued to declare from Genesis 1 all the way through. He continued to declare His Word and the prophets who spoke by the Spirit of Christ, writes Peter in 1 Peter 1, when they predicted the sufferings of the Christ and the subsequent glory. <laughs> they inquired to know by the Spirit of Christ within them, to know about two things. And if you study the Old Testament in the light of any more than these two things, you're going to get distracted. It's the most dangerous book on planet Earth yeah. until you discover the code right. that unlocks the mystery. These two things always pointed to a day and a person. And on that day, in that man, God judged mankind innocent. And he gave proof to this by raising Jesus yeah. from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ yeah. is, is God's receipt, God's proof to our redeemed innocence. You see, we need to understand in the equation of redemption. So we've got these three scales now. You've got the original, then you've got the distorted one, and then you've got the word, scripture, the promise, the prophetic word. Same. There's nothing inferior in the prophetic word. The prophetic word holds the integrity. No long wonder, no wonder Jesus pointed these two men on their way to Emmaus, to Moses, to the prophets, to the Psalms. And he pointed to himself, wrapped up in prophetic language. In many and various ways, God spoke to us prophetically in fragments of thought from generation to generation. But in these last days, in last days, it's way back 2,000 years ago, when the hour came. We're talking about an hour that, is, that, that came, not, not a delayed moment. The hour has come, says Jesus. Today, when you hear that the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So in this moment, God comes and prophetically declares that it's finished. So we've got the prophetic language holding the promise, declaring God's faith. And then I want you to go for, with a fourth picture, a fourth scale below that line. The incarnation. The destiny of the word was to become flesh. And here, he who, he who knew no sin, he becomes the incarnate word appointed to redeem at the highest price the lost image and likeness of God in man. And in the moment of the cross, every evidence on record of humanity's accumulated guilt was cancelled. And in that moment, principalities and powers were disarmed. 100%. Not the percentage of principalities, and we've got to deal with the rest. Let me back to square one. Every definition of the old system was cancelled on the cross. And to explain this, I need to take you back for a moment. We won't keep you much longer, but for a moment I want us just to reflect again on that short, beautiful parable in Matthew 13 and verse 44, where Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is hidden in an agricultural field. Would that perhaps be the same treasure that Paul points to in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 when he says we have this treasure in earthen vessel, in earthen vessels. But what's the problem? Our minds are blindfolded. Remember 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, three verses back. Our minds are blindfolded by our own unbelief, by our system of I am not disagreeing with my authentic design. So here God comes to speak the most radical language to redeem our minds from the lies that we believed about ourselves. Now picture this. Jesus tells this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in an agricultural field. And his audience at that time, they were mostly Jews. They got all excited. They thought, this is a nice story. We like treasure and stories. And then he comes out with the whole thing. He says, um, he lets the cat out of the bag. He says, a man discovers the treasure. What does that mean now? This treasure can never again be hidden. Because a man discovers it. 
And so this man hides the treasure again. Why? Because he is communicating how he was about to redeem the entire field. Now remember, Jesus did not buy us back from the devil. You never negotiate with a thief. A thief never becomes an owner. The earth is still the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That field included. The world and those who dwell in it. So ownership was never in, this, in question. So now the Jews think and they said, I mean, their business minds kick in. They think, wow, here we've got a fellow who discovered a hidden treasure. He has a fantastic advantage in the market. Because nobody else knows of the authentic value. Everybody else reasons that that piece of agricultural land is worth the wine that I can harvest, harvest from it or the bread that I can eat from it. But nobody knows about the gold. So this man has a tremendous advantage. So if he had to just kind of... You can imagine that you're sitting there thinking, man, this guy's going to buy himself the deal of the century of the ages he was about to. One would think, but, um, you know, if that field possibly represents the human race, then it's a rather neglected field, overgrown with thorns and thistles. So this man could really go to the market and need not even negotiate. He can just make them an offer, and the deal's done. But what is Jesus communicating? The gospel. And what does the gospel reveal? Authentic oneness, authentic value, authentic innocence, pre-Adamic innocence, authentic I amness, my original authority, birthed in knowing, saturated with the knowledge, then we will know even as we have always been known. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. On John 5, 20, in that day, now he says, um, we know that the Son of God has come and he's given us understanding to know him who is true and we are in him who is true. So here Jesus has his audience captured because this man is about to redeem a field that holds a priceless value. And what does this man do? He goes away and he sells all that he has and he buys the field. Isn't this exactly what he did when the treasure was hidden again in that same earthen vessel? And he went to the cross to be murdered by his own creation. He gave his back to the smiters, his cheeks, so they could tear, um, pluck out his beard. And in that moment of redemption, He disarmed principalities and powers. Amen. You see, sin consciousness had to be disarmed yes. with a valid reference yeah. for our sakes, yeah. not for God's sake. Right. God did not require the blood. Our scapegoat system of religion did. And so behold, John the Baptist says, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the essence of the gospel, is to declare to this world, like Paul declared to these Greek philosophers who strived for generations to bring better sacrifices and bring better ideas to the table and carve smarter images in their imagination. He says, God has handed out the receipt. Because the prophetic word pointed towards a man and a day. And in that man on that day, God did that righteous thing. He declared mankind innocent by raising Jesus from the dead. So we have a gospel to preach. I am so thrilled with the language of John. Even in his epistle when he begins to write about this fellowship, this word that he had rumors of. And the word was made manifest. And the only possible thing that could interfere with this fellowship is his unconsciousness. 
and going back into the old language of going, but I didn't do it, I didn't do it. I'm trying to defend my own righteousness spin when I can walk in the light as he is in the light. And what is God's light? The success of the cross. That's why the word confession, homo logeo in the Greek means. Homo, the same, logeo, language. To speak the same language. To walk in the light as he is in the light. So when there is sin, when there is temptation, I'm not trying to inform God about something that I've done wrong. I'm informing this temptation, this sin, about something he did right. But what happened when Jesus Christ offered himself, and this thing has no further claim upon my life because the document of guilt was cancelled. Can you see how sin consciousness immediately wants to bring that veil back again? Where we forget what manner of people we are, says James in James chapter 1. We see the face of our birth, our original authentic birth, our, the fact that here we are, we cannot you know, wish ourselves away. And the fact that in God's economy, we were equally embraced in his death and resurrection. And that we are co-seated in Him. And so we allow that reasoning to veil our minds, to blindfold our, our perception. To keep us from seeing the light of the gospel. Which is the glory of God revealed in us. And it's not just skin deep. The original weight. And I'm going to read you this verse. And then we're through. Second Corinthians you can go and read the whole chapter of 2 Corinthians. I'm just skipping most of it. I might as well just read you verse 7 because we've touched on it in our conversation. But here it is from the Mirror Bible. We have discovered this treasure where it was hidden all along. In these frail skin suits made of clay. We take no credit for finding it there. It took the immense power of God in the achievement of Christ to rescue our minds from the lies it believed. And you can go and study in parallel to this how God rescued all of Israel out of slavery. But their minds were trapped in the idea of an inferior image. We are grasshoppers and out there are the giants. And so we've created our illusions of giants that we have used to justify our sense of inferiority and worthlessness. Wow. Verse 8 says, We often feel completely hemmed in on every side, but our inner space remains unrestricted. When there seems to be no way out, we escape within. Verse um, 17, We are fully engaged in an exceedingly superior reality. The extent and weight of this glory makes any degree of suffering vanish into insignificance. The suffering is fleeting and ever so slight by comparison to the weight and enduring effect of this glory we participate in for all eternity. And then he says in verse 18, we are not keeping any score of what seems so obvious to the senses on the surface. It is fleeting and irrelevant. It is the unseen eternal realm within us, which has our full attention and captivates our gaze. <laughs> so our fellowship has substance. When Paul speaks about in Philemon verse 6, he says the koinonia of our faith is ignited. By acknowledging every good thing that is in us. How do we know it's there? Because as he is, so are we in Christ. Mirrored in him. Every attribute, every divine characteristic of God unveiled in you. And we are complete in him.